Hey everybody, Aaron Washington here joining you in this series, uh, Heroes of Faith. Uh, I'm very blessed that I was asked to be a part of this, to do a lesson in this series. I've definitely enjoyed uh, watching the Germantown videos that they've been posting on YouTube. I'm grateful for the ministers doing that, and I'm grateful that they've extended it to the teachers now. So I'm happy to be able to deliver uh, a message to you as a part of this series. I wanted to take uh, a direction with it that you may not be expecting, one where we're looking at people that are great examples of heroes of faith, but um, they're not coming out of Hebrews 11, uh, the hall of faith as we call it, uh, may not be people that you're expecting um, to hear, but I still think it's very relevant, and uh, especially in our current time right now. We have a lot of issues going on right now in our nation. Uh, aside from COVID, I mean, we have a lot of division that's happening right now. Socially, we have racial divisions that are going on, um, which, you know, makes it's very upsetting to me and very difficult uh, to deal with. I am mixed, and uh, so seeing such division among people is, is challenging to me. Um, also, too, there are economic struggles right now. There's a lot that's going on, and uh, thinking about that and thinking about this division kind of brought to mind uh, the Samaritans and how in Scripture and also just in history, the Jews and the Samaritans were just, they hated each other. Hate is a really good word to use because there was such animosity, such division between them. The Jews would literally make the point when traveling to go around the area that the Samaritans lived in. I mean, and they're traveling by foot and by, by animal, you know, I mean, they're not moving very fast, not like we can with vehicles, but yet they're making the point to avoid these people desperately. Uh, even if it means going out of their way when they're traveling, they're willing to do it. Um, a lot of the division came from um, racial differences and also religious differences. Uh, they both, the Samaritans and the Jews, believed to be worshiping the same God. But they had differences in belief, especially on uh, their holy place. Uh, the Samaritans believing that the holy place for the Lord uh, to worship Him was Mount Gerizim, whereas for the Jews, of course, it was Mount Zion. That was a big difference to them and something that set them apart, but also uh, racially, the Samaritans were believed to be a mixed breed, part Jew, part Gentile, Jews and Gentiles, um, you know, during the times of when the Jews or Israelites were conquered by Gentiles, and then the, the men would go in and they would, you know, take their women and stuff, and then they made, they had mixed children, and the Samaritans were a mixed breed, and so the Jews, it was almost worse to the Jews that they be part Jew or mixed rather than just being full Gentile. And to me that's fascinating because I am mixed of African American and Italian and German. So to think that being mixed to them was, was worse than being just a full Gentile is really interesting. Uh, and unfortunate that there was such hatred between them. But I want to look at how Jesus, as always, was breaking boundaries. And he was really good at that, and he did it on purpose to make a point about God's impartiality. And there are a few examples here I want to look at that call out uh, Samaritans as being great examples, where Jesus points out that they were a great example. Because for the Jews to hear that a Samaritan was doing something that he wanted them to do, that was, that was a huge deal, because they're like, we hate those people. And Jesus is like, no, not only should you not hate them, but you should acknowledge the fact that God sees what they're doing too, right? And so that difference in the fact that he was breaking those boundaries and, and showing them that there were great examples. Times where the Samaritans were, did something better than a Jew did. And we're about to look at that. And of course, the first one you may think of would be the Good Samaritan. Though he's a fictional character in that Jesus told him, talked about him in a parable, uh, I still think it's very relevant to bring up the Good Samaritan and talk about him first. Uh, in Luke chapter 10, let's go to Luke 10, and I'll, I'm going to read this. And uh, if you have your Bibles, I hope that you'll read it with me. And Luke chapter 10, I'm going to read it beginning in verse 30. Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed. 
leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. To look at this and see that Jesus, I'm not surprised that he chose two Jewish leaders as examples of the people who did not help. Because at that time, the Jewish teachers were very focused on themselves and no longer following what God wanted. But he then chooses to use a Samaritan. Again, someone that the Jews are hateful towards. To use him and say, he did the right thing. He took the time to stop and help the man. He didn't know who the man was. He didn't know where he came from. He didn't know if he was a Samaritan or not. I mean, we don't see that. All we know is that he had compassion when he saw that the man had need. And the whole reason Jesus is telling this parable, if you go back to verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So we see here that the lawyer is trying to test Jesus. This is not necessarily a genuine question of, I really want to know. This is something, well, huh, let's see what he says. Maybe he'll slip up. And Jesus certainly knows that and certainly chooses to take it a direction that I'm sure was shocking to everybody, using a Samaritan as an example. In verse 26, he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? 27, So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer said to him, wanting to justify himself, he asked, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells this parable in order to explain who is your neighbor? And that's the point I want to make out of this lesson, is that not only about serving others and those who are in need, but seeing that right now, during this really divisive time where people are against each other, I want to bring up the fact that we need to be serving our neighbors. Not just people that literally are near us, next to us, live next to us, not just our neighborhood neighbors, but even those who are, we would consider our enemies. Not enemies like in a war necessarily, but people that aggravate you, that are rude to you, that are annoying, people that you just don't like. Jesus died for those people too. And no matter how we feel towards them, we still need to serve them. We really do. Jesus said we still need to love our enemies. And in this particular example, he shows uh, where an enemy of the Jewish people helped them. And this is something that would be a big deal to them and should be a big deal to us because we have a lot of issues right now where people are fighting against each other, whether it's over the color of their skin or whether it's just over wearing a mask in public. We need to be serving our neighbors and loving each other. Uh, and that's something that we see here in this example. Uh, because we are Christians especially, and because of our faith, we need to show this service and this love to those around us. Another example of a Samaritan um, that is a great example of faith is uh, Luke chapter 17. If you want to turn there with me, I'm going to read out of this. In Luke 17, beginning in verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And this is Jesus. He's going through Samaria. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So they recognized who Jesus was. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. So as they're going to the priests, where the priests were, as they're working their way there, they all of a sudden became clean. And one of them, verse 15, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? 
But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. I love how the text points out. It didn't have to say this, but just in one little statement, it says, And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus even says, where are the other nine? This one foreigner. Jesus even points out the fact that this man is different. He's not a Jew. He's set apart. He points out the fact of who he is. And he says, even he came back to thank me. Where are the rest of them? Right? But then the fact that at the end, Jesus points out and he says, it is your faith that made you well. We can learn an incredible lesson of gratitude from this passage. Gratitude is so important. And in a time right now where it seems like there's a lot of bad going on or a lot that we don't have or a lot of negative things happening to people with illness and with people losing jobs and with people fighting, uh, we need to remember that we have so much from the Lord that He has given us and that we can look to Him and be grateful for what we have. That's something I've been having to do lately. Being stuck inside, social distancing is tough. You know, we have a baby girl, and she, as precious as she is, you know, we, uh, we don't want to get out and risk, you know, at least not get out that much and risk, you know, getting her sick. And so it's, it's tough, you know, being separated and, and working from home for me has been hard. And, but uh, it's been helpful to focus on what I'm grateful for. Uh, we have a podcast that Lucas has been doing for our young adult ministry, Yam United. You can find it on Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. If you haven't listened to any of them, I recommend it. Uh, in addition to these YouTube videos, I believe the podcasts have been very, very encouraging. Uh, but there is one that I did called Division is for Math. I recommend listening to that just about how we can get through this hard time. Just something else that uh, you can listen to on your spare time. But um, looking at this, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. This is a passage that I think really hits home the point I want to make about gratitude. Because this is a passage that I think we look at a lot. But uh, there's a part here that I didn't catch personally until I did this study and looked at it a little deeper. In Colossians chapter 3, and I'm reading out of New King James, by the way. Verse 16, starting, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And a lot of times we use that when we're talking about why we do a cappella music in worship. But then in verse 17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Sometimes we just stop there. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. It doesn't stop there. The next thing that it says, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you're doing, in word or deed, whatever you're saying, whatever you're acting, and to whatever you're thinking, because we know that our mindset should be like that of Christ in Philippians 2. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Everything that we're doing in this life, we should be mindful and we should be grateful that we can do it and that we have it and that the Lord takes care of us. And so we need to be like that one Samaritan who decided to turn around and take that one moment to say thank you. I'm sure, I mean, they're excited, right? As a leper, they were outcasts. They weren't allowed to be with their families anymore. They weren't allowed to be in the village anymore. So of course, when they're healed, they're going to be running off and excited. They probably haven't held their loved ones in a long time. But just that one brief moment, that one little thought, seemingly little thought, to turn around and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. Made the world of difference. And Jesus pointed that out. He said, wow, only one of you turned around. He said, but it's your faith that made you well. And so we need to be showing that gratitude to the Lord. We need to be mindful of what He does for us. Just that one little moment. Some, if you're driving to work, if you're at home, if things are going rough, if things are good, just take that one moment to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for me and how you take care of us. The fact that we are okay. The last one I want to look at is in John chapter 4, if you want to read with me. And this one is a bit of a longer passage, but it's got a lot to look at. In John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, 
Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples did, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. He probably knew that something was up and that he needed to do something. And he does. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So the woman recognizes this. The Jews want nothing to do with us. right? We never associate. But not only that, who are you, a Jew, to ask for me, a Samaritan woman? That's a double negative right there, because in that time, to randomly approach a woman like that, too, was, was not popular. It was not something that you heard of very much. So for him, as a man, to approach a woman, and also for him to be a Jew and approach a Samaritan, already she's just thinking, what is happening here? Are you, are you talking to me? Is that me that you're talking to? Should you, um, why are you talking to me? You know, is this happening right now? And Jesus says in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Then the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. She's like, this sounds amazing. This living water where I will never thirst again. Something that fills me up on the inside and fulfills me. I want that. Where do I get that from? Clearly, he says that it's from him. She says, how do, how do you give that? Verse 16, he changes gears all of a sudden. He says, go call your husband and come here. I'm sure that was a little confusing. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Whoa! Jesus is like, yeah, you're right, because you've had five, and the one you have now is not. I'm sure she's like, what? How did he know this? Where is this coming from? I didn't tell him that. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Because she's like, how else would he know that? Verse 20, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. There's the worship differences, right? The different locations of holy place. There it is. She mentions it herself. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me that the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. This whole section right here could preach a whole different lesson for another time about worshiping in spirit and truth. But he's telling her about how there will come a time where it'll be different, right? Right now, the Jews are God's chosen people, but we are the, it's now upon us. He says the time is coming and now is that the true worshipers will worship Father in spirit and in truth. And of course, he's talking about the kingdom of the Lord coming. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So she clearly had an understanding of the prophecies in the scripture and that she was familiar with what the Messiah would be teaching when he came. And she says, you know, a lot of this, the stuff you're saying right now sounds like something that he would say. And of course, in verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, am he. He says, that's me. I'm the Messiah. And I'm the one telling you these things. 
Verse 27, at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. See, there you go. The fact that she's a woman alone, they're, they're shocked by this. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot. Here's the part I want to point out. She left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. She came to the well to just get water, like any other day. She ended up getting something much, much greater. And she acknowledged that, and she did something about it. That's the point I want to make, is that she acted on it, and she had this desire to share it. So much so that she even left the whole reason why she was there in the first place. She left the water pot behind her at the well. She says, forget that. I've discovered the Christ. Is this Him? And she goes back to the town. She's telling the people. She's like... Is this the Christ? Come, come, come. You've got to hear this guy. This could be Jesus. This could be the Messiah, right? The fact that she just put that aside and said, this is more important. I have to share this with somebody. That's how we should be as Christians. And I, I can admit that I'm not always like that. And I know that can be a struggle to have a strong urge or desire to share that, the truth, the gospel, to share Jesus with people. But this woman, once she learned what he was saying and who he was, or at least she was familiar with who he was, she just left everything else behind and said, this is, this is more important. And she went into town and said, you got to hear this guy. Right? She didn't even take her water pot with her. She didn't even fill it up. She just says, wow, you got to get this living water from this guy who could be the Christ. And we see the result of that. Going to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. It's important to realize that it's not the woman herself who saved them, because only Jesus could save them. But the text specifically states that because of her actions and her testifying, and because she went out to them and said, you have to hear this guy, they came to hear Jesus and therefore believed. They came to know Jesus because she said something. That's where that started. It's important to acknowledge the fact that she was an example and that it was through her that they came to know Christ. And also, too, there's a, we sometimes wonder, well, how do I even do that? How do I even go about sharing Jesus with people? Jesus actually provides an example for us in this text because he, he starts off one where he has a common interest with this woman, which was they both were going to the well for water. He was tired. He needed water. She clearly needed water, too. There was a, an immediate surface-level connection there, common interest. And then they start establishing a deeper relationship. Now, Jesus, of course, had an advantage in that he already knew personal things about her, whereas us as you know, people, we have to talk about that, communicate that, establish that. But Jesus already knew, and he was able to point out things about her life. And the fact that she had multi multiple husbands may be a reason that we don't typically think of her as an example of who we need to be. But that's not the part I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that they established a relationship and she was so moved by what she learned about him and about the truth and about God that she said, I just got to, I have to share this. I have to share this with people. And it was from there that he even pointed out a need. He said, you, you need water, but this living water is really what you need. And she goes, well, what is that? Boom. He shared, he shared the truth with her. We can get to know people. We can establish relationships. We can form connections, and we can see needs, and we can share Jesus with those people knowing that Jesus can fulfill their life, just like He has for us. And I hope that He has for you. I know that He has for me. So as we look at these examples of the Good Samaritan, though fictional, He is an example of serving your neighbor and even your enemies, considering your enemy to be your neighbor, and still showing compassion and love for them, despite how they treat you. 
We look at the Samaritan who stopped for a moment to thank God, thank Jesus for what he did for him, even though nobody else around him did. He didn't follow the crowd. He did what was different, and Jesus said, your faith has made you well. And then the Samaritan woman at the well, whose faith became so strong that she turned and said, I have to share this. And she went and shared it with the people. And because she said something, the people came to hear Jesus and they believed. These are great examples of people in Scripture that the Jews were hateful towards, that there was division, they were against each other. The Samaritan woman even said to Jesus, Who are you to be a Jew talking to me, a Samaritan? And we still have division like that today between different groups of people, whether it's age, whether it's skin color, whether it's gender. But we need to, as Christians, look at how, how are we treating people? Are we serving them? Are we showing them love? Are we being grateful to the Lord for what we have during a tough time like this? Are we sharing Jesus still, regardless of what's going on? regardless of what our earthly needs are. She left that water pot at the well so she could go share Jesus. I'm not saying throw all the cares of this life behind, but I'm saying that Jesus should be far more important. And so as we look at these examples, I hope that you can go about your week, go about your day, and just be mindful of what God has done for you and how you're treating other people. I've been blessed to be a part of this series in Heroes of Faith, and I hope that you've gotten something out of this today. I appreciate you listening. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you guys again sometime in person, worshiping with you in spirit and in truth. Enjoy the rest of your week.